This is week five of the Rune Priest class, Duties, Runes, and Magic. We're going to go over some history of the runes. We're also going to cover the by the book knowledge on the runes. And then we're going to head into some kind of the magic that we see in Nordic and Viking Age. Because there's a number of references to magic and spells being believed in in gore. So to be able to role play it appropriately and stay within culture, you need to understand this section. The runes are the written letters that were used by the Norse and other Germanic peoples before the adoption of the Latin alphabet in the later Middle Ages. Unlike the Latin alphabet, which is essentially utilitarian script, the runes are some symbols of some of the most powerful forces in the cosmos. In fact, the word rune and its cognates across past and present Germanic languages both mean letter and secret mystery. The letters called runes allow one to access, interact with, and influence the world-shaping forces they symbolize. Thus, when Odin sought the runes, he wasn't merely attempting to acquire a set of arbitrary representations of human vocal sounds. Rather, he was uncovering an extraordinary, potent system of magic. There are two versions of Norse runes, namely the Elder Futhark and the Younger Futhark. We do not know which was in use in Torvald's land, but given the repeat references to rune stones, we can assume the Elder Futhark. Further, I do not know of any S.L. Torvald's land rune priest who uses the Younger Futhark. And I quote, This tinder flared immediately into flame. In this instance, I saw that we were in a large squared passage. I saw a torch and a ring, one of others. There was carving in the passage, rune letterings, and pictographs. In linear borders, before the bit of flaring moss turned into a million red pinpoints, the forkbeard took one of the torches and thrust it to the moss. The most famous rune stone in the north is that on Einar Skerry, which marks the Northland's southern border. Can you not read these runes? I asked Ivar again. I am not a rune priest, he said. Ivar's reply was not a little belligerent. I knew him to be able to read some rune markings. I gathered that these, perhaps because of antiquity or dialect, were beyond him. Ivar's attitude towards reading was not unlike that of many men of the North. He had been taught some rune signs as a boy, that he could understand important stones, for in these stones were the names of mighty men and songs of their deeds, but had not been expected of him that he would be in any sense a fluent reader. Ivar, like many of those in the north, was a passable reader, but Cook took care to conceal this fact. He belonged to the case of men who could hire their reading done for them, such as he could buy thralls to do his farming. It was not regarded as dignified for a warrior to be too expert with letters, such a task being beneath warriors. The idea that someone might not be able to understand all of the letters in an alphabet is very hard for many modern people to grasp. So let's take a moment to consider how the alphabet developed from the Elder Futhark to the English alphabet of today. It began with the Elder Futhark in use from the 2nd to 8th century. For those of you familiar with the Elder Futhark, you will notice that Saloa has another more familiar symbol, and additionally, Hagalas and Ingwas also have variations. Take a look at this picture below here. All three of those have different variations. If you want to check and compare it, you can click on this link for Read More, and it will take you to a Wikipedia page. The Elder Futhark then branched into the Younger Futhark and the Anglo-Saxon Futhark. 
The Anglo-Saxon Futh Ark was in use from the 6th to 10th centuries. So take a look at those, okay? And notice that there's not a direct correlation of absolutely everything, all right? Then the first English alphabet was a merging of Latin and Anglo-Saxon Futh Ark around 1000. There's a quote. In the year 1011, a monk named Brethford recorded the traditional order of the Old English alphabet. He listed the 24 letters of the Latin alphabet first, including the ampersand, and then five additional English letters, starting with a Trinonian note and an insular symbol for and. Look at that right at that end. Some of those are familiar to you, some of those may not be. Do you see signs we don't recognize? It's quite logical to assume that the runes that were mentioned in Marauders went through the same progression towards Gurian script with older runes now only recognizable by rune priests. This would support the quotes above, as well as create the mystery surrounding certain rune markings. All right, let's get into runestone. The practice of carving runestones began in the 4th century on Earth and continued into the 12th century. Runestones were primarily memorials to dead men. Early runestones were placed near graves. There were about 3,000 runestones in Scandinavia, with the bulk of them being in Sweden. Runestones were placed on selected spots in the landscape, such as assembly locations, a thingstead for example, roads, bridge, brid, bridge constructions, and fjords. A large portion of the discovered runestones include Christian prayers. There seems to be very few examples of runestones being raised for what we could consider religious purposes on earth. So let's talk about religious versus a claim. Quote, Many of the columns carved with painted surfaces on the walls reminded me of runestones. These stones, incidentally, were normally quite colorful and can often be seen at great distances. Each year their paint is freshened, commonly on the vigil of the vernal equinox, which in the north, as commonly in the south, marks the new year. Religious runestones were repainted by the rune priests on the vigil of the fest season of Odin, which on Gore takes place in the fall. If the stones were not tended either by farmers on whose lands they lie, or by villagers in whose locales they lie, or by rune priests, in a few years the paint would be gone, leaving only the plain stone. The most famous rune stone in the north is that of Einar Skerry, which marks the Northland southern border. Does this refer to two different types of rune stones? One's painted in the spring and one's painted in the fall? This is a great topic for discussion. It is our supposition, as in my personal supposition, that the religious rune stones were acclamations to the gods and were comprised of prayers erected as fulfillment of oaths to a god, swearing of troth to the gods in the face of the priest kings, or any other example that honors the gods rather than memorials. I'm going to come and we're going to discuss this for a little bit. While we're doing that, there's some links here where you can look at the different carvings. We do not know who actually carved the rune stones either in Torvald's land or in the Viking Age. There are no further quotes on it in Marauders. However, if you enjoy that role play, please feel free to do so. And I have provided two links for Trident runestones where you can paint them their animated prims. Painting the runes. The most common paints were red okra, red lead, soot, calcium carbonate, and other earth colors, which were bound with fat and water. It also appears that the Vikings imported white lead, green malachite, and blue azure from continental Europe. By using an electronic microscope, chemists have been able to analyze traces of colors on rune stones, and in one case they discovered bright red vermilion, which was an imported luxury color. 
However, the dominating colors were white and red lead. And again, that's an example from Wikipedia. Reading the runes. It's not expected that you have an actual ability to perform divination in role play to role play the reading of runes. Which means you don't actually have to be psychic to role play this. Everybody breathe a sigh of relief here. Though, like with physician role play, the more you know about the process, the better. There are any number of tools out there, both in Second Life and on the internet, where you can perform a rudin reading and translate it into something viable for a player. If a player asks for a personal reading, you may, if you wish, I am them, and ask what kind of reading they are looking for. Then craft your response around their request, much like physicians do when you're hurt. To allow the player and the natural development of role play not to be contradicted, you may wish to keep your readings vague. Everyone has their favorite interpretations of the runes and their meanings. I highly recommend Kydrick Olson's Runes for Transformation and Carrie Toring's The Runes, A Human Journey. Carrie also has an iPhone app available for free or nearly free with the entire book and all of the rune chants. In your role as a rune priest, you will come across those that are not playing rune priests in any form and still claim to read the runes. My character, Branwen, takes a very hard line on this. She will either insist that the person becomes a rune priest, um, be forbidden to cast the runes, or may even bring them up on charges of false omen casting. How you play it's your choice, but Marauders is very clear, the role of rune readings and rune trips belongs to the rune priests. However, we have a large selection of other forms of divination, both in Viking lore and in the Gurian books. The most common term you're going to hear is augury. Augury is technically the practice from ancient Roman religion of interpreting omens from the observed flight of birds. There are five types of auspices, from the sky, from the birds, from the dance of birds feeding, from quadrupeds, and from portents. There's links here on this. The harspex. In the religion of Apent Rhone, a harspex, plural harspex, har I can't do that, was a person trained to practice a form of divination known as harspicy. The inspection of the entrails of sacrificed animals, especially the livers of sacrificed sheep and poultry, the reading of omens, specifically from the liver, is also known as heposcopy, and this is practiced by the two chucks of gore and others. Sortilage, which is by the casting of lots or sorties, um, that is practiced in the Viking Age. Let's see if I can pronounce these. Robomancy, by wands, sticks, or rods was also practiced in the Viking Age. Dreardomancy, by dripping blood, practiced on gore, and here's a quote. Then soberly, though I acknowledged it as superstition, I performed the green ritual of looking into the blood. With my cupped hands, I drank a mouthful of blood, and then holding another in my hands, I waited for the next flash of lightning. One looks into the blood in one's cupped hands. It is said that if one sees one's visage black and wasted, one will die of disease. If one sees oneself torn and scarlet, one will die in battle. If one sees oneself old and white-haired, one will die in peace and leave children. The lightning flashed again, and I stared into the blood. In that brief moment, in the tiny pool of blood I held, I saw not myself, but a strange face, like a globe of gold with disc-like disc eyes, a face like none I had ever seen, a face that struck an eerie terror into my heart. The darkness returned, and in the next flash of lightning, I examined the blood again, but it was only blood, the blood of a sleen I had killed on the road to Korabah. 
I could not even see myself reflected in its surface. I drank the blood, completing the ritual. There's another clarification of heposcopy by the liver. Here is a quote from Assassins of Gore. After the murder of Om, who had been on tolerable, tolerable terms with the administrator, the new high initiate, Capletius Seronis, in studying the omens of the white bosk slain at the harvest fest, had, to his apparent horror, discovered that he had stood against Kazrak. Other initiates wished to examine these omens, being read in the state of Bosk's liver, but Capilius Sironis, as though in ter terror, had cast the liver into the fire, presumably that such dark portents might be immediately destroyed. This next link on magic and prophecy quotes um, cover things that you will want to know. We have a lot of quotes out there. These particular ones are not very long, but they come from the Viking Age. There are also by the book quotes that you can find out about the different types of prophecy that was practiced in Gore, and I have all those links. I'm going to take a quick pause to see if um, anybody has some comments to add, and then we'll move on to magic. All right, magic, Galdar, Sidar, and Spey. There are three forms of magic practice in Norse tradition. They are called Galdar, Sidar, and Spey. There are a number of conflicting interpretations as to what each of these practices involve and how they are performed. The following is an extrapolation from what is known and is my personal experiences. Everybody's open to argue or disagree with me on this. This was the best I could do to break it down and explain it. Galdar. Galdar is the Old Norse word for spell and incantation, and which is usually performed in combination with certain rites. It was mastered by both men and women. Some scholars have assumed that it was chanted in falsetto. The incantations were composed in a special meter named Galdarang. This meter is very similar to the six-lined Lodorhater, but adds a fifth, adds a seventh line. Another characteristic is a performed parallelism. You can look at the stanza from the Skiersman all below. A practical Galdar for women was one that made childbirth easier but they were also notably used for bringing madness into another person, whence modern Swedish galen meaning mad. Moreover, a master of the craft was also said to be able to raise storms, make distant ships sink, make swords blunt, make armor soft, and decide victory or defeat in battles. Examples of this can be found in Grodal, and in Firha Saga, in Groldar, Gro chants nine, a significant number in Norse mythology, Galdars to aid her son, and in Bosloven, the schemes of King Ring of Ostergotland are adverted. It is also mentioned in several of the poems in the Poetic Edda, for instance in the Havimal, where Odin claims to know 18 Galdars, for instance, Odin mastered Galdar against fire, sword edges, arrows, fetters, and storms, and he could conjure up the dead and speak to them. These are quotes out of Wikipedia. It is my assumption that Galdar represents the rune charms that were learned by Odin when he hung on the tree, and the best translations of this can be found here under Odin's rune poem, if you're following along with me. There is also a link on how to chant runes specifically in Galdar, which is the point that becomes a distinction is whether or not they chanted phrases or they chanted runes. We don't know, and if I find out, I'll let you all know. 
For the practical purposes of roleplay, Rune Priest would perform Galdar almost exclusively over that of Sidar, which was considered women's magic, and even over Spey. Some believe that Galdar also include the creation of magical staves, rune bindings, and runic magic. We will address this separately. Sidar, pronounced Sedar, Norse rune means cord, string, or snare, is a form of pre-Christian Norse magic and shamanism concerned with discerning and altering the course of destiny by reweaving part of destiny's web. To do this, the practitioner with ritual distaff in hand enters a trance which could be accomplished by numerous means, and travels in spirit throughout the nine worlds, accomplishing his or her intended task. This generally takes the form of a prophecy, a blessing, or a curse. There's a link here. The primary distinction in the practice of Sidar is the use of the trance state that allows the practitioner the ability to influence Erdur, commonly known as weird, which is an Anglo-Saxon word. Historically, we know that the vulva were known as staff carriers. The role of the staff can be seen coming up through the history of Norway and Sweden as parts of various traditions, a woman carrying a staff preceding a throng. The staff in question was called a distaff, a tool used to hold wool that would be woven on a drop spindle. There is a deep association between cord and string and weaving and cutting of Erdur. If you want to learn a little bit more about what a vulva is, here's a link by Kari Taring. You may also watch her videos to get an example of what kind of practice Kari is doing with her stavs and singing. In the practice of introducing a trance state, runes or other passages sung in Old Norse would be used. Unlike Galdar, however, the chanting along with the rhythmic tapping of the stave is intended to enter a trance state and direct the cedar kona towards a specific goal. For example, the rune rido may be chanted over and over, almost to the point where it is no longer even understandable to discern the likely outcome of an upcoming voyage. It is important to note that from our previous classes that the concept of future is very different in the minds of the Norse people, and so the divination is based on the understanding of each person's urlog and the strings of weird that are woven between them, the gods, and the universe as a whole. The difficulty of explaining this action in roleplay should be obvious. For the most part, anyone observing would only see a woman or a group of women sitting on three-legged stools, pounding staves and chanting. Observers would not be a part of the trance journey. Consequently, it has been my practice to do this kind of roleplay privately only with those I intend to take with me. Further, it is very difficult to accurately describe the worlds connected to the agrazel unless you have made a deep study of them or have traveled there yourself. This may seem to suggest that engaging in this kind of role play is out of the grasp of the average person taking this class, and that is, in some sense, what I'm suggesting. This is not a role play that you should be just winging it, or others who are far more knowledgeable than you, either in their role play or in their real life practices, will judge your attempt harshly. To learn this role play, you must really engage in it with another who has the experience to teach you or start down your own spiritual path in real life. If you wish to do so, Carrie has an excellent manual that you can utilize the Volvo Stav Manual, and here is a archaeology of Cedar. I'm going to go on and I'm going to cover Spey, and then we're going to stop and we're going to talk for a bit. Spey. Simply speaking, Spey is a form of prophecy. 
We don't have a lot of information what specifically Spey was. Here is some information regarding the Spey wife in Scotland. According to the 19th century Orkney folklorist Walter Trail Denison, the Orcadian wise woman, or Spey wife, was said to possess all the supernatural wisdom, some of the supernatural power, without all of the malevolent spirit, without any of the malevolent spirits of witches. He goes on to say, the women of this class were skilled in medicine and surgery, in dreams and foresight and second thought, second sight, in forestalling the evil influences of witchcraft. Such women were looked upon with a kind of holy respect. The spay wife in Arkney was generally well regarded in her local community, treated with odd respect that in many cases probably bordered on fear. Primarily regarded as healers, these women were indispensable members of each community, called upon for healing, childbirth, charms, and protection from evil. My personal experience. My personal experience is that spay is the use of second sight. Wikipedia describes second sight as a form of extrasensory perception that supposed power to perceive things that are not present to the senses, whereby a person perceives information in the form of a vision about events before they happen, precognition, or about things or events at remote locations known as remote viewing. However, my experience is a little more literal for me. Spay is literally a second sight seeing things that are not perceived by my actual eyes. I perceive this when performing divination, when dreaming, when meditating but not trancing, when sleeping, and even when I take a moment to shift my perception and observe. The experience is nearly the same for me in all cases, though dreaming occasionally feels like it has shifted into Siddhar. Consequently, how do we role play this? Rune bindings. In real life, when I am determined, when I am determining how to put rune binds together, I may take my runes and toss them down and pick each one up, one at a time relevant to how they fall, so as to see which runes call to me. Or I may choose specific runes and then practice using chalk in a near semi state of trance to draw out the various rune combinations in chalk. Then, when I have found the right combination, I will transfer them to wood and carve them. There is a fantastic YouTube video on how to create and bind runes, how to create and activate bind runes. You can click that link there and watch it. You should absolutely watch it. Next, magical staves. Everybody, while I'm talking about this, go to the link and open up the Icelandic magical staves and take a look at them. Everybody's seen them. However, the history of magical staves begins in the 17th century in medieval grimoires. It is my personal opinion that the Icelandic magical staves of the 17th century were heavily influenced by the Salamic seals in popularity at the time and I do not use them. Okay. Role play advice. How to role play magic in Second Life Gore. First off, it is important to understand that there are no examples of magic actually working in a supernatural sense. There are examples of more traditional illusion and such being performed in magicians of gore, but it is the illusion of stage magicians, not supernatural practitioners. Consequently, it is very important how you use your language when dealing with any kind of magical role play. Let us take the case of a glowing shield that protects the users from arrows. We would not say that the shield glows. We would say it appears to glow, gives the impression of glowing, is rumored to glow, or even that some might believe it to glow. You must not say it is glowing. Not everyone in Gore or Second Life wishes to believe in magic. Even if a large portion of the Gorean populace might have believed in magic, you must allow each role player a chance to choose for themselves how they will role play with it. 
The examples of magic we have been shown in the books of gore is not Disney nor Hollywood magic. It is not shiny or flashy. It does not have special sparkly effects. Avoid any scripted items that have particle effects or otherwise. In Hollywood, magical items sparkle and glow. This is how they show something is magical. Instead, in a more practical world, examples show us to use that magical items may give off a warmth or a chill to those who are sensitive to such things. They may softly glow some color to a person who has a second sight. The effects of an item should never be assured it will work. Use language that is going to be viable for someone who wishes to believe in magic to work with such as the shield will seem to slow arrows as they come at you, a great excuse for lag, or will turn a mortal wound to a lesser wound, a great way for someone not to die from an arrow. If you come across someone who is role-playing that a magic item is glowing and can do something, you have entered a role-play that is not by the book, and it is up to you on how to proceed.